Hello. Uh, welcome to today's session. My name is Martha Goodell from Harriet Watt University and I'm co-leading this session with Christine Haddo from Edinburgh Napier. Hi there. So this lunchtime we want to take you on a journey through the landscape of the measured university. A landscape that is varied and at times challenging to navigate. We start by acknowledging the huge volume of data and evidence that infuses many aspects of contemporary university life. Wherever we stand in this landscape, there's a multitude of different data to understand, different voices to listen to. Some are more prominent, more commanding and more visible on the skyline than others. Others are more hidden, but require attention and recognition. We can, and we do, spend a lot of time navigating what often feels like a fog of data and measures. And with measurement also comes comparison and questions of excellence and success. Who stands at the pinnacle, at the peak, increasingly matters. And we're particularly interested in today's webinar in what's not in this picture. The people and the infrastructure in the valleys below the interactions and the everyday activity of the university which actually makes things work. What's the connection between measurement, prestige and the dizzy heights and the everyday actions and interactions of university life? Between indicators of success and the cultures of change and enhancement that really make a difference? Actually, maybe we need to reframe that question. It's not just what is the connection, but who is key to making that connection. So through this webinar, we want to bring into focus the role of programme leaders, those colleagues who occupy a critical space in the landscape, directing and leading across a suite of courses or modules. A group that, as Katrina Cunningham has noted, can be considered the invisible superheroes of learning and teaching. And we'd like you to walk this route in their shoes. So where will our journey take you? Through the session, we want to make programme leaders' work visible. We'll be drawing on insights from our work with colleagues across the Scottish sector as part of the QA Enhancement Themes Collaborative Cluster on programme leadership. We'll specifically consider two intertwining aspects of the role. Firstly, the expectations placed on programme leaders in terms of their engagement with evidence for enhancement and their leadership of programme change. And secondly, we step back to consider the wider enhancement culture, the extent to which institutional contexts facilitate or hinder the capacity of programme leaders to own and lead that change. As Alison mentioned in the, at the start, there's two interconnected pathways for you to explore through the seminar. So I'll be your guide through the main route on this presentation. But if you want to meander off and explore some areas in more detail, to chat along the way or to share ideas as you go, Christine will be helping you navigate discussion in the chat box to the left of the screen. Um, we really will use that space to share links to some of the key outputs from the cluster work that have been developed and you'll be able to explore those and go into a little bit more depth and detail than we're able to cover in the webinar here. So do please use that space to raise any questions and to share any examples of practice that you might have been working on. So let's begin our journey by considering where programme leaders sit in the evidence landscape. As part of our cluster work, we set out to understand what the evidence landscape looks like from the programme perspective. We started by appreciating that programme leaders are required to navigate and respond to a complex data landscape at the level of university, discipline and individual students. Indeed, they not only engage with evidence for enhancement, but also produce evidence for enhancement and are responsible in turn for evidencing that change has happened through NSS action plans, annual programme reporting, cyclical reviews, and so on. Alongside this focus on the programme leader's role, we also considered as a cluster how programme leaders were supported to fulfil the enhancement dynamic of their position. What practical approaches helped empower programme leaders, help them build effective teams and lead enhancement activity. So last year, a series of events were convened to explore dimensions of the programme leader's role and the wider context of programme leadership support. 
We held a series of workshops to spark conversations on central themes, such as uh, engaging with student voices, in, in, which encompassed a, a whole suite of, from, the, from exploring um, data such as NSS sources, to, to actively engaging with student voices in a multiple and diverse set of ways. Looking at the, the dynamics of the programme team, and looking at the rich and um, somewhat fraught area of programme leaders' workload and the time, recognition and reward that is given to the role. We created a series of think pieces as the discussions developed and Christine will be sharing links with some of those in the chat box as we go. They're all available on the Enhancement Themes website. The value of this cluster approach is that we really had no fixed and determined destination at the start of our work. It really gave us the space to explore and involve our thinking and practice collaboratively as we went. And what emerged was a really rich set of discussions. And what we wanted to do here is provide you with a flavour of this as we continue on the journey through the evidence landscape. So our first stopping point on our journey is to give us a view of programme leaders at the nexus of a diverse set of data collection and data production exercises. Many of the key features of the higher education landscape and the data landscape, such as the NSS, have a particular focus on programme level activity and engagement. There was a concern from a number of institutions involved in the cluster with exploring and in some instances, auditing how programme leaders engage with institutional and national survey data, what, what evidence they looked at, what evidence they explored, and how, they, how programme leaders were then able to demonstrate their engagement through action plans and so on. So there was a strong focus across, uh, across some institutions' work on upskilling, refreshing and refining processes for understanding evidence and creating more targeted, more refined plans for development and action. But as well as focusing on the funnel that was coming down onto programme leaders from a, a funnel of requirements that was coming down from the institution, Programme leaders also occupy a critical position for ideas, voices and calls for support that are funnelling up from colleagues and students uh, within the programme and across the associated courses. So this point at the nexus of two different funnels of, uh, of voices and, and, and interest in evidence uh, and, and sharing of perspectives leads to potential overload and indeed potential conflicting priorities within that space. And we sought to explore and consider that through the cluster. So programme leaders are navigators of the evidence landscape, but they're also brokers of that evidence, shaping and framing how student voices are listened to through surveys, through staff student liaison committees and the everyday interactions of programme teaching and programme support. The role is one that is a, that critical in, interface, able to engage with individual concerns, yet also they, they're, as, as a group, programme leaders are in the sight of the wider institution. They're often the focus for reporting, for intervention and for demands for change. As Maggie King noted in her provocative think piece, are we letting the process of monitoring metrics and action planning reporting on action planning uh, get in the way of real programme level enhancement? And it was this question which echoed through much of the work that followed and prompted a series of other um, thought pieces and discussions that, flew, that, that, that flowed from that. In exploring this, it's vital to consider how the programme leader role is defined supported, recognised and rewarded if we're going to move to strengthen a wider culture of enhancement within our institutions. So let's move now to look at what programme leaders actually do. It's a deceptively simple question, but one which occupied a lot of the cluster discussion time and institutional action in the last year. 
There might be a role descriptor, uh, but in many cases, these are not jobs that people applied to do. Uh, rather, uh, many of the programme leaders who were involved talked about the role being thrust upon them of not running quickly enough from it. Um, in, in other cases, it was something that, that people valued and, and wanted to engage with, but it was often talked about in terms of um, a role that was seen as quite overwhelming, as one that wasn't necessarily fully formed and understood, and the process of induction and support into it was, um, was mixed across the sector. Across the piece, however, it was a, a, clear, a clear sense that the, these, these roles were encompassing a mixture of administration, uh, of management, and some space for academic leadership and direction setting. Programme leaders talked about a hugely diverse set of expectations in terms of what they, they did and how they were to direct and support others. Some of these were articulated, but others were learned and encountered, often unexpectedly, on the way. Much of the role had to be discovered and learned in role and as, as work developed. So a number of institutions have set about over the last, the last period to explore what, that, what their, their tasks and the, the role actually involved and what the, the landscape of work looked like and the landscape of evidence looked like in terms of what programme leaders had to encounter. The breadth of this is particularly well illustrated in the detailed mapping exercise that Edinburgh Napier undertook. There's absolutely no way that you're going to be able to read and uh, see the content on all of this. Uh, but I wanted to illustrate it just in terms of the breadth and the depth and the sheer volume of different dimensions of the programme leader role that they, they um, highlighted. They mapped out the various layers of the role and the tasks to be completed. Um, across the different stages of the, the, the programme year. This resulted in what can only be described as a highly detailed, if not daunting, checklist. So the challenge that flows from this is how to back up this recognition of the complexity and the depth and the breadth of the programme leader role with the support, the guidance and the time needed to deliver uh, this work. So it's not just a question of here of clock time. As the, the, the previous slide demonstrated, we need to think about the rhythm and the temporality of the programme leader's work. There are immediate demands that have to be dealt with, um, crises that have to be in, engaged with on an everyday basis. Compared with that, there's also long-term change, cyclical reporting, cyclical engagement with surveys, student voice and processes of, of incremental enhancement and change. But workload models tend to operate in clock hours. We need to find a way for building an understanding, as Phil Wood puts it, of the rhythm of the academic year and the time space is needed to actively engage with evidence and help shift approaches into a more paced, enhancement-oriented approach rather than rapid response to whichever voice, whichever set of data is particularly dominant at a particular time. So crucial to this is the hugely diverse does that, does, crucially, despite this hugely diverse and demanding set of expectations, the value and the visibility of programme leaders within the university landscape is somewhat mixed and at times very hidden. As Sam Ellis highlights in his think piece, there is generally limited prestige associated with, with programme leadership within institutions, and limited visibility for, for those in those roles within and beyond their institution. So Sam Morgan argues that there is a significant juxtaposition between the potentially critical enhancement role of programme leaders, cited at that nexus of many different voices and sources of evidence about learning and teaching, versus the very limited institutional recognition and support for programme leaders. So what can and what is being done across our institutions to move from managing measurement to creating a programme-focused culture of enhancement? In exploring this, 
consideration has to be given to the different spheres and the different dimensions of institutional practice that impact on the scope for enhancement. And so here I think it's important, and, and we started the cluster focusing on what is it that the programme leader is doing? How are they engaging with particular metrics, particular evidence for enhancement? And we saw as the, the cluster work developed, a need to look at the wider spheres of influence um, that impacted on the ability of programme leaders to act um, and, and that actually influenced the, 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 that wider context. So it's really important that we begin to explore the, the wider um, notion of the programme team and how we begin to, to create programme teams as collaborative spaces, collaborative entities. And we need to consider whether institutional contexts are appreciative of the programme leader role. And finally, we, we, over the course of the, the cluster, we were interested in that wider sphere of influence, the, the spaces to connect, recognise and amplify the role of the programme leader within a sector context. How do we open opportunities to share insight across the wider sector and give real visibility to this role? So what examples of practice emerged um, from, from our work? Um, that, that highlighted how to strengthen the cultures of enhancement within and across programmes. What was interesting is that small practical steps really did seem to make a difference. So in terms of strengthening programme teams and creating trust and collaborative spaces, it was the very practical tools that we were able to, to, um, to share that Around, around workload across a programme team, but being transparent um, about the distribution of work uh, across a programme team, opening up space for greater collaboration and greater trust across the team, and then opening up space to share um, a discussion and conversation that led to more enhancement-oriented approach. Related to that, there was also very a, a need to support programme leaders to, um, to know how to engage with diverse voices. So while w many institutions now have mechanisms such as um, student staff liaison committees at the programme level, having practical guides and support and um, about how to actually manage those meetings, what activities elicited um, conversations that were not just complaints or, or moans or gripes about a programme, but opens up space for collaborative student staff engagement with, with the change process uh, was, was really important. And through the cluster, we saw some very practical examples of how that, that, um, those interactions and encounters could take place. Similarly, questions around time and giving space and legitimate time within workloads for programme teams to meet, um, to, to share report writing, to explore data and evidence together was often not factored into workloads. And I think it, where that was the case, we saw more um, examples of um, people being able to share and, and work together when that space, that space and that time was legitimated. So that visibility and the appreciation was um, was really vital at that level of the program annual reporting. And so we saw from, from one institution, they actually get their program leaders together now to help um, at, a, at, a, at a time to share and do their program annual reporting together in a collaborative space so that they can share practice as they go. That makes us a really strong sense that these reports are not just being funneled up into the system, never to return, never to be seen again, but actually being seen and being valued by the institution. And that leads us into that notion of creating an appreciative institutional context. The question of, of programme leadership and its link to promotion was a fraught one in our discussions. Um, whether the program program leadership was actually genuinely seen as academic leadership or a manage or just or simply as a management and administrative task was one that that caused some fairly heated discussion um, through the, through the through the cluster but what we did see was some very practical examples of where um, reward and recognition was being provided 
Katrina Cunningham's think piece talks about the focus on leadership and change and how that was being recognised through um, HEA fellowship and using that fellowship mechanism as a way of allowing programme leaders to recognise the leadership and the impact on uh, learning and teaching that their work was having, and being able to evidence their practice um, uh, as part of their institutional uh, reward and recognition programmes. There was also a discussion about, about the role of pay and reward and recognition um, and on creating spaces for that within institutional frameworks. And finally, we'd explored how to legitimate sector collaboration. Those connections which we were fortunate to be able to create through the cluster activity um, was seen as incredibly valuable and incredibly rare. For programme leaders to be allowed to attend events, uh, to have that external visibility was something which didn't happen very frequently. So I think as a challenge to the sector, we need to question how we're going to open up and, and continue to support um, that cross institution collaboration and support um, and op open up opportunities to see programme leadership as an area that is deserving in itself of inquiry, of scholarly consideration and of enhancement in and of itself. So we argue then that strengthening programme level enhancement isn't simply about programme leaders being better informed about evidence and data sources. A whole institution reorientation is required to recognise programme leadership as absolutely central to the enhancement landscape. So it's not just about programme leaders understanding data and evidence, but ensuring wider institutional culture supports and values that pivotal role. So we conclude um, by returning to the question that Maggie Shearer po pointed us to. Are we asking the right questions about programme leadership? Are the questions we're asking taking us on a fruitful path through the evidence for enhancement landscape? How are we equipping and supporting programme leaders in their journey? Do we really want to risk weighing down our colleagues who are leading programmes with even heavier backpacks of things to do, metrics to consider, pinnacles of success to attempt to ascend? Or can we see this as a landscape of support, of recognition, of building collaboration and sharing expertise and support a culture that puts programmes and the diversity of student and staff voices that converge at this level at the heart of our approach to enhancement. So to move from metaphor to action, we've pulled together um, insights from our cluster work and we've come up and condensed this down into a simple set of questions to guide engagement um, at institutional level. And what we have here, and we'll make sure this is circulated and available um, after the session, is a simple set of questions that you might want to explore and take forward um, at, at different levels within your institution. Um, so we, we look across the four spheres from empowering programme leaders through to programme teams and then the wider institutional and sector context and ask a series of questions um, that about what currently exists, the current landscape, then exploring what evidence is being used at each level, and then prompting some questions that are going to lead to, to pushing the boundaries on how you might actually move to more enhancement-oriented culture. We hope that you'll be able to have a look through this as a, as a tool to guide institutional uh, work and institutional thinking in this field and hope that the conversations which flow from this opens up space for exploring those alternative pathways and alternative ways of engaging and supporting programme leadership. So they do not just become a repository of a heavy backpack of data and evidence, but actually have the space and the freedom to explore a more enhancement oriented journey. So that was a bit of a whistle stop tour. And we're going to conclude there um, and pause to open up to comment and discussion. So I guess we'll turn first to Christine and ask if there are any reflections and comments from the chat box that you want to, to raise from and, and feed into the main forum. 
Yeah, there were some really um, interesting insights from practice at particular institutions coming out, actually. So we were talking a little about the challenge of kind of balancing some of the more administrative tasks um, with the PL role with actual meaningful enhancement activities. And we were reflecting on how some of the things that processes that are intended to be enhancement based, things like annual reporting and accreditation and program review and things like that on a larger scale often become more like box ticking exercises and become more about you know, something to just get through rather than a meaningful pause to take stock of things, how how things are going on a programme um, and to actually implement new things and, and enhance the programme. So there were some interesting reflections on how different institutions have approached that. Um, Ruth was talking about how some institutions or her institution have looked to take away the management of some of the more objective data that we might get, so kind of survey results, and to produce that aspect of programme reports relatively centrally, and then to distribute that to programme leaders, if I'm getting the process right here, Ruth, um, so that they could then reflect on that, and, and the role of the programme leader and the programme team was much more to reflect on how that works, rather than to actually navigate the data themselves. Um, and we were also talking about how other institutions, um, Katrina suggested, have maybe changed some of the, the actual cycle of monitoring so that it might not be an annual approach. It might be done in a two-year time frame to provide an opportunity to look back and look forward rather than doing that every year. So that, I think that's really important. I think the work that, that at Strathclyde that, that's been referred to there, I think, is, is somewhere in terms of shifting the focus of the, the cyclical mm -hmm. review is really, really vital and, and offers some interesting insights. And I think across the sector as a whole, the, the, over the last two years, we've seen quite a sea change in how programme leadership is being approached and addressed. And so I think it's vital that actually that that conversation at a sector level is able to continue, that we're actually able to share that institutional, those institutional shifts that are feeding through, because it feels that there's some quite exciting um, exciting work coming through that as a sector we could begin to, to share and, and to lead on uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, absolutely. If there are any further questions, comments, suggestions, things that you wish we'd talked about and shared more, more generally, um, things we skimmed over that you would like some more detail on, then please do use the chat box and uh, let us know. So I think that the um, these question guides and the the spheres of impact discussions will all be available after the session um, mm. that we can that you can pick up and follow follow up with us or any of our colleagues who have written these fantastic think pieces. Um, please do to get in touch and follow up on anything. Um, so I think if there, I don't know if any of our colleagues at QAA would like to, to follow up on any questions as well, then that would be, do let us know. I noticed there's, a, there's a, some furious typing going on in the chat box, so we'll give people a chance to feed their questions through. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, I, 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 no, no further questions from this end from QAA. Just to say, I'd, having been involved with some of those cluster um, meetings, I can... Um, with the cluster workshops last year, kind of to how valuable they were and how, how valuable the discussion was. I'm just seeing if actually if I can upload the your results to this meeting because I think I should be able to. Right, so I think it says it says everyone can download. So I think participants might be able to go to the. I think it's in the button next to the hang up button. There might be a, a, a button that says can share content. Aha, you should, yes, you should have got a notification at the bottom of the screen saying someone added an attachment and if you click on that then it should open for you um, the document that Martha and Christine and colleagues have pulled together with some of these questions to guide uh, enhancement conversations. Um, so we'd recommend that, that you have a look at those. Um, and also to just, we obviously recommend that you explore some of the links that Christine's been posting in the chat box, um, which take you to the think pieces that this cluster has produced. Um, really, really valuable stuff. 
So I just wanted to flag, Alison, that we are now taking some of these high-level questions forward into to, to developing a toolkit for programme leaders, which um, we would, where we want to, do, to, to, to then explore behind these questions, what are the practical steps that institutions, that individual programme teams and individual programme leaders can then take to help enhance their practice. So we'll be developing that um, over the next couple of months. Um, and we really appreciate if anyone does have any further um, evidence of practice that they would like us to flag and share within that space then do please get in touch with Christine or myself and we'll make sure that gets included in some of the toolkit of advice and guidance that we're developing for the sector um, over the next couple of months.